This program is made possible by the giving of the God Called Partners of Renner Ministries. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. Today we're going to continue talking about spiritual warfare and spiritual weaponry. Once a year, I always discuss the subject of spiritual weaponry because Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18 says, God has given us spiritual weaponry to put the devil on the run. And if you feel the enemy is trying to access your mind and your emotions, or he's attacking your family or your finances or anything that is yours, you have everything you need in you to push the devil back across the line. You do. And today we're going to be talking about exactly who is the devil and what kind of forces has he arrayed against us. But on the set, I have all kinds of things to show you this week. And tomorrow we're going to really begin to get into all the specific pieces of weaponry. For example, here on the set, I have a replica of a Roman shield, a Roman spear, a Roman loin belt, Roman shoes, a Roman breastplate. I have a real authentic sword from the first century. I know it doesn't look like much now because it's been laying under the earth for more than 2,000 years. This is real. I have here on the set greaves. These are greaves. These were wrapped around the lower legs of a soldier to protect his legs. When you understand how this has to do with peace, it will simply bless you. I have here a piece of a battle axe, which was used to take the head off of a soldier. And that's why every soldier needed to have a helmet. And behind me, I have a whole collection of real authentic helmets from the ancient world. On the far end, we have a Greek helmet. Then we have a Macedonian helmet, which was the very kind worn by the soldiers of Alexander the Great. Next to that is a hoplite helmet, which is just amazing because it's in such good condition. Next to that is a helmet which was worn by Roman soldiers in lower Italy. Then there is a helmet which was worn by Scythian soldiers. But every soldier wore a helmet because the enemy carried a battle axe. And not only that, but the enemy also used flaming arrows, which the Apostle Paul refers to in Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to begin seeing that starting tomorrow. This is the real arrowhead of a once flaming arrow. My friends, these were all real weapons which were used in the ancient world. And when you come to Ephesians 6 verses 10 to 18, the Apostle Paul gives us all of these illustrations as weapons which God has given to you and to me. We need to know what they are, how to identify them, how to use them, how to grab hold of the power of God. It's all so important that I cover this once a week every year in this program. And I want you to have the full series. Now this week, we're just teaching five times on this, but there's a 10-part series on this called Dress to Kill, a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor and it comes with a study guide so that you can read all the points while you're seeing or hearing the series. And we're offering you my book, which is by the same title, Dressed to Kill. The full title says, you don't have to take it anymore. And you should just say that. I don't have to lay down and take it anymore. Why? Because you're dressed to kill. You've been given everything you need to put the devil on the run. And if you don't have a copy of this book, please order yours now by going online or by giving us a call. And hey, let us know how to pray for you. We want to pray for you. We'll stand in faith with you to push the devil back across the line. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Reach for your Bible and let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 and begin reviewing in verse 10, where Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. If you didn't hear that teaching on Monday, please go back to the archives and listen to it or order the entire series. Then yesterday we covered verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And in yesterday's program, I outlined the five important words you need to understand so that you will really comprehend how the devil operates and how you can foil his attacks. But today we're going to move on to verse 12 where Paul writes, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness 
in high places. And in this verse, it's almost as though the veil of the Spirit has been pulled apart and the Apostle Paul has supernaturally seen into the spirit realm to see how the devil's kingdom is organized. And he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And remarkably, Paul uses one word five times in this verse when really it's only needed once unless you're really trying to make a powerful statement, and that is the word against. He uses the word against five times in this verse when one time could have been sufficient by itself. But because he wants us to understand that our battle is against these powers, he repeats it five times. And guess what? The word against that he uses is not the word anti, which I would have assumed he would have used. It's the word pros. And the word pros describes something very upfront, very intimate, very close. In fact, this word pros is used positively in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, to describe the relationship between God the Father and Jesus in Jesus' pre-incarnate state. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That word with is this same word here translated against the word pros. But in John 1, 1, it says, tan pros theon. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was pros with God. You could translate it. And the Word was face to face with God. It pictures intimacy between members of the Godhead, God the Father and Jesus so near to each other. They are prostantheon, right next to each other. They can nearly feel their breath breathing upon each other's face. Intimate contact between members of the Godhead. Now, this same word pros is used by Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, to describe what kind of contact we're going to have with demonic power somewhere along the way. Now, I know that we all like to think spiritual warfare is what happens to somebody else on the other side of the world. But Paul uses the word pros five times to alert us to the fact that at some point in our spiritual life, we're going to come pros face to face, rib cage to rib cage, shoulder to shoulder with dark forces that have been marshaled against us. And Paul uses this word five times to drive the point home. You better have power. You better have weaponry. You better know how to use these things because these forces at some point are going to come close. And he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's talk about the word wrestle. This word wrestle is so very, very important because in Greek, It doesn't just describe a wrestling match, but it really describes combat, combat. It's from the Greek word poly, and the word poly describes combat sports. And in the ancient world, there was in every major city a place called the palestra. Now stay with me. I'm going to give you a little history because I want you to understand what Paul's talking about. The palestra, taken from the word poly, means struggle or combat or it describes a very fierce fight. But in the palestra, the palestra was like an athletic complex. It was a house of struggle, a house of combat sports. And there were only three primary kinds of sports that took place inside a palestra. Now in the gymnasium, there were all kinds of sports. But beyond the gymnasium, there was the palestra, ay, ay, ay. And only three major sports took place here. Number one was wrestling. Number two, boxing, and number three, a sport which was called pancration. So you had these three sports which took place inside the palestra. Number one, wrestling. Number two, boxing. Number three, pancration. Again, in the regular gymnasium, there were other kinds of sports, but in the palestra, only these three specific kinds of athletic activities. And they weren't like the athletic activities we know of today. For example, wrestling. When they wrestled, they wrestled to the finish, and sometimes one of the opponents would die in the wrestling match. They could break backs. They could gouge eyes. They could pull your tongue out of your head. I mean, it's just absolutely horrendous what they did in those wrestling matches. Then there was boxing. And in boxing, they wore leather that was wrapped around their arms all the way across their hands, and often a nail was affixed to each knuckle so that when they struck you, they could gouge out entire pieces of your face. And that's why if you look at the ancient vases of the Greeks 
and you see the boxing matches are illustrated on those vases. Sometimes an ear is missing, a part of the face is missing. That's because they were facing opponents that had nails that were serrated on the end of their knuckles. And very often one lived and one died. So that was wrestling. That was boxing. But wait, there's one more. Pancration. Aye. From the word pan, which means all, the word kratos, which is the word for power. But when you compound the two words together, a pancratos was the one who survived the wrestling match. He survived the boxing match. Now he's come into the ring to fight the others who survived their wrestling match and their boxing match. And they come with all kinds of weapons. And they literally fought until one lived and one died. It was a fight to the finish. Those three kinds of sports took place inside the palestra, the house of struggle, and that's where we get the word pale, which is now translated wrestle in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Well, if you just read this in the King James Version, you just see in your mind the picture of two modern wrestlers that are slugging it out on the mat. But my friends, there's much more to it than that. The Apostle Paul is telling us at some point in our experience, we're going to come face to face with powers that have been marshaled against us. They will wrestle us. They will try to gouge us. They will try to take out our eyes, snap our back. They will try to take us down to the finish and wipe us out. And that's why he says to us, we need to have power and we need to have spiritual weapons. Now we have all the power we need. We have all the weapons we need. Jesus has given us everything. And yet, Paul still explicitly wants us to understand what kind of powers will be marshaled against us. So let's look at it in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. First, he says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. That's important for you to know because the devil will try to always pull you into a fight with what you can see. But working behind the scenes, there are invisible forces. And he begins with the first, which he calls principalities, which is from the Greek word archos. The word archos can describe that which is ancient, but it also describes those which hold the chief seats of power. We would call these the highest demonic powers which have held their lofty positions since ancient, ancient times. These are principalities. It's where you get the word for a prince. These are prince demon spirits. Then he says against powers. The word powers is a form of the Greek word exousia, which describes those that have received license to do what they want to do, wherever they want to do it. These are roaming spirits that move about doing whatever they want to do, and they've been authorized by the principalities to do it. Then he mentions against the rulers of the darkness of this world, which is a really unusual Greek word, the word cosmokrateros. And when I first saw this word, I was a student at the university and I was just dumbfounded because I understood what it meant but didn't understand its connection with demon spirits. The word cosmo crateros, the word cosmos can describe the universe. Sometimes the universe is referred to as the cosmos, but in fact, the word cosmos by itself describes anything that is ordered, anything that is disciplined or anything that is arranged. The second part of the word is kratos. The word kratos is the word for power. But when you compound the two words together in this verse, it is the word cosmokrateros. It describes power that has been arranged, power that has been organized, power that has been disciplined. And in fact, the word cosmokrateros was a word sometimes used to describe a boot camp where young men were turned into soldiers. Well, think about it. What are young men? Well, when they come into boot camp, they're just disconnected young men. They have a lot of ability but they're not organized. They're not disciplined. But when you take all those young men and bring them into a boot camp or into a military training center, you take all of that raw power, you organize it, you harness it, you discipline it, you organize it, and then you send them forth as a force. That's the word that is used in this verse. And the reason we need to understand it 
is because the Paul is telling us that the devil is so serious about his victimization of the human race that he takes no chances. He takes demon spirits, all their raw power, organizes them, harnesses them, and dispatches them. And I say that when he dispatches them, their motto is kill, steal, and destroy. That's John 10, 10. The thief cometh not, but to steal, kill, and to destroy. They march forth with those marching orders. And what they do, they do by training. There are certain spirits that are trained in cancer. That's all they do. And when they kill one person, they dislodge and move on to do it to somebody else. There are spirits of perversion. And once they've twisted one person's life, they disconnect, move on to twist somebody else's life. They're specialists at what they do. They're spirits of infirmity. They're spirits of addiction. They're trained to do what they do like soldiers. Then they are dispatched again with the motto, kill, steal, and destroy. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to alert you to the fact that the devil is very serious about what he is doing, and we need to be serious. But then Paul goes on, and he says spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wickedness is a form of the Greek word poneros. It describes something that is evil, something that is wicked, something that is malevolent. It's what these spirits want to do. They want to carry out malevolent actions. They want to be destructive in what they bring into your life. But the verse says in high places, and that is a misnomer because the Greek word is actually eros. And in Greek, there were two words to describe the sky. There's the air above the mountaintops and the air below the mountaintops. And the air below the mountaintops is the environment where we live, where we breathe, And this is the word eros, which is used in this verse, which means when the devil is finished training evil spirits, he doesn't dispatch them out into the universe where there's no one to attack, but he brings them down low into our environment where they begin the process of attacking marriages, attacking young people, attacking people's self-images, attacking people's finances, attacking people's health. They are dispatched into the lower realm where we live, where we breathe, into our environment because they have come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. Now that is a lot of information about Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. And Paul says, you better be ready for this because when they come, Pale, it's going to be a wrestle. It's going to be a wrestling match. It's going to be a boxing match. They're like Pancratus. They are so committed, they're going to fight until they try to take you down. And that is why Paul then says in verse 12, 13, wherefore, the Greek says, Diatalto, in light of all of this, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, which means we are not helpless and we are not victims. God has given us everything we need, not just to stand, but to stand against the wiles of the devil. My friends, the greater one lives in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us. We have the blood of Jesus. We have the Word of God. We have the authority of Jesus' name. We have everything that we need. But Paul is alerting us to this reality. And he says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. And take unto you in Greek here is the word analabete. The word ana means to repeat it again or to pick something up. The word labete means to take. When you compound the two words together, it means pick it up and do it like you once did it, which means the Ephesian church is no longer wearing their armor. They've dropped their weaponry. That explains why they're under attack. That explains why they have bitterness, why they have malice, why they have backbody going on inside the church. This was a mature church. Their heads were filled with information, but they're living far below what they know. Why? Because they've dropped their weaponry. And that is why Paul says in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the Greek word analabete, pick it up, put it back on, wear it the way that you once wore it. They were a church standing with all their weapons laying on the ground around them. And Paul basically says, no wonder you're under attack. Reach down, pick it up, put it back on again which is good news because it means if you have walked away from your weaponry, you can put it back on again. You just need to make a decision to repent for walking away from the power of God, receive a new infusion, pick up that weaponry, put it back on. And when you put that weaponry back on again, the verse says you will be able to stand against, stand against, literally pictures you pushing the enemy back across the line. 
So if he's violated your finances, if he's violated your marriage, if he's violated your kids, if he's violated your health, he has proceeded into your territory. When you're walking in the power of God and the weaponry of God, you can say, no, sir, and you can push him back across the line. That's what the verse says. And it goes on to say, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. What is the evil day? Sometimes people say, well, that must be someday prophetically in the future. No, it's not. It's any day that you wake up and evil is in your day. <laughs> if you wake up and get a bad medical report, that's an evil day. If you wake up and suddenly find out something's falling apart in your finances, that's an evil day. And rather than just wring your hands and say, oh, we're under attack, take unto you the whole armor of God and push that evil back across the line. Anytime evil shows up in your day, you have everything you need in you and on you to push it back across the line. God wants you to be free and he has given you the equipment and the power to make sure all of these forces that have been marshaled against you will be foiled, you have everything you need to stand against them. And tomorrow, we're going to begin looking at all the specific pieces of weaponry which God has given to you. So don't miss tomorrow's program. But I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. The devil is real, and as long as you seek to live in God's will, obey his word, and drive back the forces of darkness, the devil will do his best to oppose and thwart the plan that God wants to accomplish through you. But God has given you everything you need to victoriously stand against the devil and to thwart his attacks. That's right, God has provided you with a complete set of spiritual armor that will put the devil on the run every time. With that weaponry at your disposal, you are dressed to kill. In the in-depth 10-part series, Dressed to Kill, Rick Renner covers the power needed to sustain you through any battle, the seven weapons God has provided for you to use against the enemy, the way to stand victoriously against the wiles of the devil, the God-given strategy to keep the devil under your feet, and so much more. This powerful, life-changing 10-part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. You can also order Rick's companion book on spiritual armor and spiritual warfare called Dress to Kill. This fully illustrated 500-page book will answer your questions about the often misunderstood subject of spiritual warfare. It will teach you how to put on the full armor of God and the important role each piece of armor plays in defeating the enemy. This powerful classic on spiritual warfare and spiritual armor can be yours for just $22. Don't miss this special offer, this series, Dress to Kill, and Rick's companion book, Dress to Kill. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Hey friends, this is Rick Renner. You say, Rick, where are you? I'm in the central meeting room of the Tulsa office and we just concluded a wonderful staff meeting here. I wish that you could meet our team who ministers to our partners. That means they minister to you. They are so trained and they are so committed to minister to people who are reaching out to us from across the face of the planet. And when I say people are reaching out to us from across the world, I really mean from across the world because people are looking for teaching that they can trust. And this building is so important because this is where all the activity happens, particularly where we minister to partners and where we produce materials which we send to the ends of the earth. And right now, we want to retire the debt on this building because if we can retire the debt, it's gonna free up finances so we can take the teaching of the Bible further across the face of the earth. Today, I want to invite you to become a part of our giving team. Would you please join us? Help us retire the debt on this building, free up finances, so we can take teaching that people can trust to them wherever they are all over the world. And my friends, if we have to do it by ourselves, it's gonna be hard that if we do it together, we can get this done. So if you're a part of the giving team, thank you. And if not, please pray about becoming a part of our giving team. Well, today we have seen that God's given you power and God's given you the weaponry to push the enemy back across the line. 
And if you feel the enemy has tried to penetrate your marriage or your kids or your grandkids, or the enemy has tried to penetrate your health, you don't have to stand there and say, oh, I'm just being attacked. My friends, you have everything you need in you and on you to say, you know what? You have crossed the line and I'm pushing you back across the line. You do not belong in my territory and you are moving. You have the weaponry you need and you have the power you need to stand against all the wiles of the devil. And if you need somebody to pray with you, reach out to us right now. We'll pray with you. We'll help launch the assault to move the enemy back across the line in Jesus' name. But reach out to us and let us know how to pray for you by calling us or by sending us an email. And remember that we're offering you right now my series. It's 10 parts, which is called You Don't Have to Take It Anymore Because You Are Dressed to Kill a biblical approach to spiritual warfare and armor, and it comes with a study guide. And we're offering you my book by the same name, which really is a classic. It's read by believers all over the world. If you don't have yours, please order yours today. You can order all of these things by going online or by giving us a call. But put your hand on your heart, and I want to pray with you. Father, I thank you that you've given us the power we need You've given us the name of Jesus. You've given us weapons to push the enemy back across the line. And thank you that we don't have to take it anymore because we're dressed to kill. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, tomorrow we're going to begin looking at all the individual pieces of weaponry that God has given to us. Don't miss it. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior and Lord, now is the time for you to experience a new life Jesus has to give you. Pray this prayer with me right now. Lord, I repent of my sin and receive you as my Savior and Lord. Wash away my sin and make me completely new. I thank you that my sin is removed and Satan no longer has any right to lay claim on me. I faithfully promise that I will serve you as my Lord for the rest of my life. Amen. If you just prayed the prayer of salvation with us, would you please let us know by going to renner.org forward slash salvation? We would love to connect with you. Renner Ministries is proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ through every available media to the uttermost parts of the earth. Discover the many ways you can help us make a difference in lives around the world with the Word of God. We invite you to partner with us in teaching, strengthening, and rescuing lives for the glory of God. Together, we can make a difference that will last throughout eternity. This program was made possible by the giving of the God-called partners of Renner Ministries.